Mike Troy, Homeland Security and Counterterrorism Expert Advisor. Also formed, I just <laughs> got a word salad in my mouth. <laughs> She's the advisor to former Vice President Mike Pence. She left the administration in 2020, and she is now trying to unite both sides of this aisle to protect Americans from our epidemic of gun violence. Please welcome Olivia Troy. Yeah. Welcome to the I said this to you the last time you were here. I'm just so proud that you left in 2020 because you knew the response to COVID was ineffective. And I appreciate you because I lost family members and you were right to leave. So thank you for that and having that courage. That means a lot to me. Now, former President Trump has been indicted on 91 felony counts in four criminal cases and is being sued by the state of New York for fraud. But he is leading by a landslide. The latest, uh, I think it was this morning's consult poll at He's at 61%. As a Republican, why do you think so many people still have this blind loyalty to him? What does that say about the party now? Well, I think it speaks to an unfortunate state of the Republican Party. It's certainly not the party that I want it to be and it, not the party that I believe that it has been in the past. I think he has done a great job of sort of marketing himself as the champion uh, for all of these people who are behind him in this movement. Yeah. But like I, we've sat in these meetings. What is so frustrating and angering to me is the fact that he has nothing in common with any of his supporters. And I, I detest the way he speaks about them. Like oh. when he would talk about them in meetings, it was so disparaging to them. And I think about my own family members who, by the way, are very unhappy with me. I've got a lot of family members who are still Trump supporters. They're very upset that I am a Trump critic. I think about them, and I'm like, I hate the way you speak about them sometimes behind closed doors. They must be used to it from their families. <laughs> yeah. Something going on there, because I don't understand it either. Yeah. Everybody know he would, would he invite any of these Trump supporters to Mar-a-Lago, as I'd like to know. I don't think so. Anyway, let's not talk about him for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> because, he, because he's been going after your boss. He goes after Mike Pence he does. since the insurrection when, according to testimony from former White House aides, Trump said he deserved the hang Mike Pence chance. Now, you know, you know both of them very well. And poor Mike Pence is polling at 5%. <laughs> I mean, that's a sort of a sad number. So um, why doesn't he just take Trump on? Because he's not going to win if he just stays neutral or stays away from it. You're right. I, w I wish he would. Um, honestly, I have been wanting him to take Trump on from day one, um, especially on January 7th of 2021. I wanted him to be out there saying this is everything that we've lived. Um, I, ha you know, I have tremendous respect for former Vice President Mike Pence still. I worked very closely with him. He and Trump could not be any more different. Um, they are very different people. I can tell you that uh, well, Mike Pence gets a lot of criticism. I know he's got some more very conservative views on certain issues. He really believes his faith, um, and I think that's what guides him. And I think, you know, you, can, you, you, say, uh, you say can't judge again. him for say that. Say that part again. I think, you know, he's got some more very conservative views, um, especially, you know, women's rights. I think he, I Pence wish he does. would move, Pence does, to the middle. But I, I do believe that he is a man of faith, and I think he does follow his faith, whereas I can't figure out what faith Trump actually subscribes to if there in is any way, if there is any, other than the hate and divisiveness. The almighty dollar is what he <laughs> right. I wanna, worships. Valid point, valid yeah. point. I want to ask you... It's all about the grift. I want to ask you about the speaker position um, now that Kevin McCarthy has been voted out of. Jim Jordan has said he feels very good about the odds of him taking over. Do you think that, that he has those votes, and do you think he can reunite the party? I, well, first of all, no. I don't think that he will unify the party at all. I think uh, putting a cat in charge would be more unifying than Jim Jordan, to be honest. And that's saying a lot, because I'm allergic to cats. Well, then take care of the rats. Yeah, well, there you go. Uh -huh. <laughs> There's well, a few of them. I was dying to ask you this question. So we're, we're friends. You were such a support system to me when I uh, spoke out against Donald Trump and continually have been for so long. But our mutual friend, Cassie Hutchinson's book came out recently, which detailed um, a number of behind the scenes stories and former senior aide to Donald Trump Peter Navarro tweeted out asking 
why men in the White House would ever hire a woman again after watching people like you, like me, and like Cassidy speak out and went on to call us pimp ladies. What is your response to that? Well, what is a pimp lady? <laughs> yeah, well, that was my first question. <laughs> yeah. I was like, okay, I don't know whether they're comparing us to a certain kind of group of people there or what is going on here. I will say that it's typical Peter Navarro, um, and, and I, it, what is really frustrating is how disparaging they are, yeah. especially towards women. Yeah. And it's been the women that have been the strongest, I would say, in many ways, in speaking out against Trump across the board. And when they have nothing else to come and you know, attack us with, it's about us or it's about being ladies of the night, to put it in a <laughs> kinder term or whatever disparaging thing they want to say. But I'll say this about Peter Navarro. He was one of the craziest people working in the Trump White House. Really? Um, I'll t give you an example. And that's hard to do. Yes, that is, that, <laughs> yes. There was a lot of that, was that was a whole new level there. Um, I'll say that I was under strict orders by my Pence's chief of staff to keep him out of his office and to not let any of the documents or propaganda that he was kind of issuing, I say propaganda because a lot of it was really just kind of crazy stuff that he was writing up memos on, especially during the COVID pandemic. There was a time in the West Wing where he actually walked up and I literally took the documents out of his hand and I was like, thank you, I'll make sure he gets them, meaning I'm gonna go shred them right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's be honest, because my job was to make sure that it did not get into that office and make sure that he wasn't gonna spread disinformation, which he wanted. He actually grabbed my wrist. Oh my and grabbed my hand and wanted to wrestle the papers out of me and you could see the anger bully. and I, a bully. he is a bully, bully and he is mean and he's, you know, he's got that violence in him. I saw him do it to Dr. Han, mm -hmm. the head of the FDA at the time. He got in a screaming match where Mark Short, the vice president's chief of staff at the time, uh, Mike Pence at the time, had to actually come in and interrupt the argument and be like, okay, what are you doing? He was yelling at him about hydroxychloroquine. So this is the oh. kind of individual that we're dealing with. But right here's now. my question. Oh. Do they not recognize that every time they disparage women, they lose women to the Republican Party who don't want to be discussed or talked about like that? You think. You, you would, would think, think that, they, that, because they keep saying, you know, we've got to get more women. And every time they say, then they come out with a, a, a line of craziness like yeah. that. What's happening? Are they just slowly going crazy because they don't know what else to do? <laughs> what's, what's going on? I certainly think that's part of it. I think, you know, I, I think that they've got nothing else to go to when they do, though. They start to mudsling. I'll say that. You know, that tweet to me that was so offensive because I was like, what you're saying to women is that we don't belong in the White House, right. that we don't belong in those jobs in the White House. And like, uh, and I, I, I think that is what's so frustrating. That's what you're saying to young women across the country. Or that I you're not allowed that. to call out stuff when you see right. something wrong. And really quickly, I do want to get to um, your new project. You're the executive director of the 97% Project, which is a bipartisan group on a mission to combat gun violence. What can you tell us? What are the efforts underway? Yeah, I, you know, look, I come from a national security background. I grew up in Texas. I, you know, I am, I'm a gun owner. I am, I grew up um, around guns. Um, and I grew up with responsible gun ownership. 97% mission, um, I think, is a critical one, which is why I have signed up to, to lead this effort. It is to really bring gun owners into the conversation and bring them to the table and to, in order to work on reducing gun deaths across the country mm -hmm. while including them in the solutions. And I think that's critical because they are a critical part of this conversation. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of the time they don't feel their voice is heard. So we are gonna continue to do the research. We're gonna continue to invest in technology that promotes safety for gun storage mm -hmm. um, and preventing suicides, things like that. Um, and also, I mean, if you're a gun owner, I want you to come talk to me and tell me what you support. How do we make a difference? How do we make a difference in this space? All right, thanks to Olivia Troy. Come back and talk to us again.